well. So it's my pleasure today to um, have Paul Megan here. Um, so he's going to be talking uh, about his research. You've read his paper, so hopefully there will be a lot of discussion and interesting questions that will pop up of this. Um, so whenever you want, um, the, the floor is yours, Paul. Okay, thank you, Guillaume, and uh, hi, everybody. Um, I hope we can have some interesting conversation today. And thank you, uh, Guillaume, for inviting me and for having me today. It's really nice um, to have this opportunity. Um, so what I'll do, first of all, before I get started and introduce myself, for example, um, I'll just share my screen. Um, so can we all see that OK? Is that OK? Can you see that OK, Guillaume? Good. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking today um, about decolonizing English, um, unlearning cognitive and linguistic imperialism, um, and just an overview of the talk today. Um, I'll first position myself as a, a learner researcher. Um, I'll then discuss relationality in language, stories and knowledge in language, the foundations of colonial English and the epistemological error. Um, I'll then touch on unlearning cognitive and linguistic imperialism before speaking more to decolonizing English, respecting learning from and enacting alternative ways of knowing and being in education. And then I'll round off today's chat uh, with some concluding remarks and leave um, the class open to some question time. Um, so one thing before I begin, there, there will be questions that I prompt during the PowerPoint presentation. So it's mainly for you to have the opportunity to, to think um, while, while the presentation goes on. So feel free to add your comments or questions in the chat as we go, um, because I know that sometimes you can forget when new things are addressed. So feel free to do that as we go and I'll address any questions or comments you have at the end um, together. So um, feel, please feel free to do that. Be, it would be great if you could as well. Um, so um, positionality then, who am I? It's Mr. Paul Meachan Chiblo, Shege Lahanam, Hami Aglasku, Haunan Alabach, Shea Ran Sahara Hanam, Anna McGill University, Montreal, Isma Ur Khan Yuchug. Um, so in English, um, I introduce my, myself in my language, which is Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic. Um, my name is Paul Megan Chiblo. I'm a Scottish Gael. I'm from Glasgow, Scotland. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at McGill University, Montreal in the Department of Integrated Studies in Education. And it's really nice uh, to be talking to you all today. So where am I? Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the land where I'm presenting this virtual presentation from, the plants, water, animals, and spirits. For thousands of years, Kronta has been the traditional land and territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and today is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Um, I'd also like to say I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to work and to live on this land. So um, some reasons for my research. Um, well, my research started out based on personal experiences of the harm of colonization on indigenous and heritage languages in the United Kingdom and in Canada. First of all, growing up in Scotland and Glasgow, my language, Scottish Gaelic, was not available to me in the education system. I couldn't learn it. The only languages available were Spanish, English, or French, for example. Um, also, I've learned as I've gotten older, older generations can recall that they were beaten for speaking the language in schools, or they would get a, a skull around their neck. Um, so basically to detract them from speaking the language and only to speak English. So um, I'm on a journey of reclaiming my language and um, my culture, the Gaelic culture as well. And I also have learned more since meeting and marrying my Anishinaabe husband um, in Glasgow five years ago. I've learned more about the devastating impacts of colonization on the indigenous peoples and languages of Turtle Island, or what is now known as Canada um, and North America, or North America, I should say. So these experiences have driven me to enact more equitable education and language policy and to envisage what that looks like, where we can all access our own languages um, and our own cultures and not be pushed or forced to speak English, for example, or colonizing languages. 
So my research focuses on indigenous language revitalization and decolonizing language education. Um, and I focus in on decolonizing applied linguistics. So I'm not a quote unquote a linguist per se, I'm more of an applied linguist. So, uh, and I focus on social and eco-linguistics as well and what basically the inseparability of language, culture and land. So without further ado, then that's a little bit about me. Um, this is how I would like to start today's talk uh, with this quote by Bell Hooks. Um, it's not the English language that hurts me, but what the oppressors do with it, how they shape it to become a territory that limits and defines, how they make it a weapon that can shame, humiliate and colonize, putting the emphasis here on the speakers and what can be done when a language is weaponized. So relationality in language, the belief system or worldview through which we language is fundamental. There is a relationship between language and the environment and languages are connected to the political, social, culture and ecological context with which evolve around them. Um, and this quote here from Nash encapsulates that sentiment pretty well. Language and ideas of self and the environment are amalgamated in complex relationships. So some let's say Western linguists may view language as abstract or as a decontextualized code for conveying universal cognitive categories or messages between speakers. But I'll leave a question here that maybe just to prompt you and you can, like I said at the beginning, you can of course write your comments or questions in the chat box. What are the effects of this, of decontextualizing language and viewing language as just a code? Well, this disregards the social, cultural and ecological grounding of language, and it makes it easier for language to be viewed as a commodity uh, that can be leveraged for economic profit to meet the demands of capitalism or linguistic imperialism. So the commodification and disembodiment of language and the lack of education on alternative sustainable ways of knowing and being have been contributing factors to the current crime, climate and humanitarian crises. So that's the stance I take with this. So language, more than simply being a code, shapes our belief systems, our values and our behavior. Linguistic choices are a result of mental models or the interpretations of sensory data. And that translates into how we correspondingly relate to the world, our environment, our fellow beings examples. So here, using a grammatical context, um, Halliday considers air or oil as uncountable nouns or without limit, and a tree as, a, well, English can conceptualize tree as an inanimate or an unconscious being. Or um, more metaphors, for example, to talk about land and our environment uh, that are ecologically destructive. Um, some examples here, dirt, wasteland, wildlife. If we label traditional and respected territories as wasteland, we may become more complicit in its mistreatment because we have already put it at a linguistic hierarchy where it is lower or more inferior perhaps to other uh, territories or other parts of the land. And wildlife, similarly, if we treat, view animals as quote unquote wildlife, do we become more complicit in their mistreatment or in how we relate to them? So it's just some questions there to open up uh, how we relate in language. So our categorizations impact on our everyday perception of our surrounding environment and ultimately how we treat it. So a question here, how do our categorizations in English impact on our perception and on our treatment of our surroundings and our fellow beings? With the climate and humanitarian crises, some are becoming more aware of that certain ways of understanding or naming our environment and fellow beings is not equitable or sustainable. I should have changed that. It shouldn't be positionality. We're going off of relationality here. But Bateman has, has an, a quote here. We must understand the process of negotiation between man and nature. What can go wrong when the negoti negotiation goes wrong? Global warming, flooding, loss of biodiversity. Even here within this quote between um, some of the, the word choices, man, for example, or global warming, those are um, 
could be framed differently, but it's just another example of the process of negotiation and what impact that has. Global warming, could we call a climate crisis? Would we be urged to react differently if we frame or view things in a different way? So on and so forth. So loss of biodiversity here, and to this I add loss of linguistic and cultural diversity as well. So stories and knowledge and language, more equitable and I argue that a more equitable and sustainable way to language would be to question the worldview, the mental models that inform our perceptions, frames of reference and assumptions. Um, Rosenfeld states our society's relationships and senses of self are constructed through story. The stories we tell, the stories we uphold and the language we use are informed by the way we view and understand the world. So we could search for new metaphors or existing ones, I should say as well, it's not, ne not necessarily new metaphors or new stories to live by as opposed to myths we live by. And myths here, I've just added in lies, uh, the lies we live by. Uh, Okri encapsulates this sentiment, stories are the secret reservoir of values. Change the stories that individuals or nations live by and you change the individuals and the nations themselves. So new collectively told and retold stories could move towards more beneficial alternative forms of language, truth telling and myth or lie debunking. Question, how can we tell alternative stories and respect more than Western knowledge systems? So the foundations of colonial English, English is a dominant Western language with a colonial and assimilationist legacy. Colonial English has been imposed on non-dominant cultures and quote unquote vernacular or inferior languages under the tenets of civilization, linguistic imperialism and cognitive imperialism. Hegemonic dominant Western thought holds a anthropocentric or human centered perspective, which places the purpose of humans in or views them at the top of a hierarchy. And that enables an imperialistic control and exploitation of earth, nature, and the human or more than human quote unquote other. So this view of English, where does it come from? Well, it can be traced to the British Empire where Great Britain acts in this quote here from 1867. You can see Great Britain acts as a mighty teacher. And while she sits in her matchless powers of political supremacy, commerce, wealth, and literature, these influences will combine to diffuse the language with all the excellences kindred to it throughout the whole world. So we can see here this notion of Western superiority or English superior, Anglo-centric superiority can be traced back to the British Empire. And before, there has also been the, the eradication of Celtic languages and cultures within what is now known as Great Britain and the United Kingdom as well, for example, Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic. So linguistic imperialism has led to a worldwide global linguistic and ethnic genocide of the peoples colonized by the British Empire. Examples include the genocidal residential school system in Canada, where, quote, the aim of education is to destroy the Indian. In many cases, this colonial story or history is left out of our books and is plainly and or plainly avoided in many forms of curriculum. The danger of ignoring this colonial and assimilationist legacy resides in human exceptionalism, uh, believing that humans are above all else in some form of imagined hierarchy, or quote the epistemological error here coined by Bateson in 1972. So some examples here, the positivist objective view of the Western human as quote unquote superior to the rest of nature and or the quote unquote other has led to a na naive empiricism or believing that uh, let's say Western scholars can objectify everything else and uh, the, the legitimate sources of knowledge and data. This has led to an arrogant elitism in research and in teaching. And this epistemological error dominates the current mainstream Western and anthropocentric worldview, our institutions, our mental models and the English language. So positivist reductionist Western language re research and teaching methods have uh, of inquiry have also subordinated theory and knowledge to imperatives of efficiency and technical mastery and history is reduced to a minor footnote in the priorities of quote unquote empirical scientific inquiry. So a quote here from Giro in 1983. So as you can see here, a lot of these quotes aren't exactly new. So this lack of historical balance and consideration of social culture and political contexts in linguistics and applied linguistics has led to colonial teaching methods 
extractive Western research paradigms, methods, and quote-unquote scholarly knowledge. And here is an example of Smith as well, who has said this in the reading that was um, given for this week as well. Uh, she touches upon these issues. This has upheld continued white epistemological supremacy and racisms. And the languages that are acknowledged or, and or implemented in the classroom or in education in general or in our day-to-day -day lives largely tend to be colonial, quote unquote, official nation state and or non-endangered languages. So I argue by understanding these roots of Western human exceptionalism or the process of negotiation between uh, man and nature, we can begin a process of unlearning. We can decolonize the mind by questioning the mental models and assumptions through which we interpret the world, decolonize English by creating new Earth-centered stories to live by, and move toward a more equitable, sustainable, and transformative way of viewing and interacting with the world, i.e. our environment, our fellow beings. And fellow beings, I don't just mean humans. I mean more than humans as well. So human exceptionalism neatly separates the human from the non-human, I would correct us to say more than human, um, and views humans as separate or superior to the rest of nature. This Western colonial worldview holds, of course, an anthropocentric or human-centered perspective, essentializing the purpose of humans into control and exploitation of Earth and its resources, and I touched on this earlier. So Earth, basically, in hegemonic Western thought, is viewed as a resource for humanity, for humans. And the objective of humans is neoliberal economic growth, consumerism, and quote-unquote technological progress. However, as I pointed out, language is inseparable from the environment. So how do we deal with this um, conflict, this imbalance? There is a need to make English language education or education and language in general more culturally and environmentally responsive in order to pose, quote, deeper questions of linguistic and cultural inequalities in relation to colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, and associated language ideologies. And this is citing uh, Dr. Ryoko Kubota um, in 2020. Um, and I contend that a more sustainable way to language would be to review, to critique, to question the dominant neoliberal Western worldview of human exceptionalism, linguistic imperialism, that informs our ecologically and culturally destructive assumptions. So to avoid essentialism, of course, because we don't want to fall into a trap of making binary assumptions again, not all English or colonial language speakers think or speak the same. However, there is a note of optimism, if you like, we can have an alternative worldview. We don't have to think the way we think or make the same assumptions. However, English language speakers who have enacted a colonial human-centered worldview of human exceptionalism and linguistic imperialism have legitimized and been complicit in the subjugation of non-dominant cultures and destroyed ecosystems. Uh, on a world level, the trickle-down effect of this imbalance can already be felt through the impact of the human caused in climate and humanitarian crises. And at a classroom, let's say educational institutional level, learners are viewed through a heritage language deficit lens, learners experience ethnic ambivalence, uh, ambivalence and evasion, linguistic discrimination, whiteness, and learners are being marginalized by white listening subjects. As Leinenen remarks, mainstream education reflects deeply our Western worldview, which is the underlying cause for the sustainability crisis. And to that, I would add the humanitarian crises. Just an interesting note here, unless we are bi or multilingual, English speakers who have not been exposed to alternative ways of knowing and being are more likely to accept the ordering of experience imposed upon us by the English language as natural, as common sense. Oh. I don't know, I've always thought this way. Um, I've just learned to think like this. But ideo uh, and ideologies determined by lexical grammar, such as anthropocentrism or domination by na of nature by humans might remain latent or undetected, um, citing Coatley here in 2018. So question, having said all of that, what can we do, what can you do to address the imbalance and epistemological error of Western colonial education and colonial English. So educators and educational stakeholders could frame language in a more positive manner, which no longer views nature or the quote unquote other as passive or inferior and enables cognitive and linguistic decolonization. 
This epistemic and transformative learning can enable this shift in awareness and a way of seeing the world from a reflective perspective. Why do I think this way? Why am I saying this? It's a constant process. So decolonizing English. In English, in education, we can start this process by learning from Earth-centered, not only human-centered perspectives, decolonizing our thought processes and mental models in English that may have gone undetected, and collectively inspiring a bottom-up paradigm and perspective shift in educational instruction to fully embrace and validate more sustainable and holistic worldviews. As Lining explains, the main goal of education would be to give future generations tools for thinking and seeing the world differently, constructing their own worldviews and acting to create a sustainable future. Question, again, so feel free to be adding these as we go, any comments or responses, um, and it doesn't have to be fully articulated at this point because uh, I may understand that this might seem like a lot to process, but to feel free to write and respond as we go. How can we enable a space where we, i.e. everyone, can learn and unlearn and construct our own worldviews? Or maybe we have worldviews already that have been silenced. We could learn from Earth-centered or ecocentric worldviews which are not grounded in human exceptionalism. For example, indigenous worldviews, although different and varied across nations and across the globe, share some key characteristics such as principles of reciprocity and relationships between communities and the local environment. For indigenous peoples, language and culture are viewed as one and the same and as inseparable from the land. So safeguarding indigenous languages and learning from these ecocentric perspectives counteracts the human exceptionalism, the linguistic imperialism, which characterizes the Anthropocene and is a primary local response to the climate crisis. These knowledges are already existing. Indigenous languages transmit knowledge, such as traditional eco ecological knowledge and governance systems through positive Earth-centered stories, song, humor, ceremony about how we can meet our needs in harmony with nature without destroying the ecosystems of which we are part or coming in with an arrogant elitism like I talked about before, assuming that quote unquote we or quote unquote researchers or quote unquote applied linguists or linguists know better. So as Abraham explains, the linguistic patterns of an oral culture remain uniquely responsive and responsible to the more than human life world or bioregion in which that culture is embedded. So learning from indigenous or ecocentric worldviews can inspire new ways of using language that respects the natural world and conveys positive stories about the relationship of humans with nature. For example, there's a doom and gloom narrative that the, the dystopian fiction that we may read about science fiction that the world is all is going to be destroyed and we're all going to be robots or we all need to build a space station on Mars. How do we counteract these dystopian narratives that are foreseeing or forecasting already the inevitable doom of um, humanity. We can learn from indigenous and ecocentric worldviews. Question, well, I kind of answered or gave a little bit of an example there, but just to make us think, because again, these it's not about having the right or wrong answer, it's about having a conversation and a dialogue about these things. Because again, we all come from different lenses, different worldviews. How can we learn from indigenous and ecocentric worldviews? So an F-centered view of language can enable us to decolonize our thought processes, mental models, implicit assumptions, and take for, taken for granted, quote, Eurocentric logic. And just some questions here. What do, what do we mean by Earth-centered view of language? And how can we unlearn destructive language and mindsets, destructive language and mindsets that have been ecologically and culturally destructive? So decolonizing English, respecting alternative ways of knowing and being. Education, the place of the moment where minds are formed, sculpted and made is a place to start. We can prompt our learners, our family, friends, colleagues, and of course ourselves to continually reflect on our worldview or experiences and our language choices. We need to hold ourselves accountable. Uh, we can share how we have each related to our surroundings, people, the environment, objects, the land, and at certain points in time, infancy, childhood, adulthood, the point here is we should all be feeling that we're still learning as we go. I, I, I wouldn't, myself personally speaking, I would, it, it would be scary to think that I've reached a point where I've, um, I, I know it all. I wouldn't, I, I would, because that's not true. I learn something every day. And how our worldview and language has evolved or not in that time, we can chart that, we can reflect on that process. 
We can also share experiences and understandings that we may have in our heritage culture and language. For example, disenfranchised cultures and languages um, as a result of colonialism, which have emotive and cultural significance. And in my experience as a, a, an applied linguist and a language educator, for example, these experiences could be shared in a story, drawn, performed, taken as part of a video, or written as part of a reflection log as part of a decolonizing English learning journey. And I call this a heritage language pedagogy. So there are greater opportunities in this sense to relate to and share experiences, uh, reflect on our heritage languages and our traditions. And this leads to a greater transfer, uh, trans systemic, um, systemic worldviews. And I think that was Batiste. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head the year of publication, but she mentions a trans systemic um, knowledge transfer, knowledge co creation, where we share local knowledge, which could enable sustainable, respectful solutions in combating the climate and humanitarian crisis we are currently experiencing. For example, share how our ancestors used to take care of the land or sharing their original name for a place in the indigenous language for insights about the local ecosystem. And just on a personal note, in my, like, um, my background, in Gaelic, in my home islands, uh, in and Sheer, there's a stretch of water called which translates as the dipping marrows of the sea, and it guides fishermen in their day-to-day -day work. However, you wouldn't know that unless you've lived there for hundreds of years and you know the sea, because it's not like you can put a map, or well, I don't know, something on the water and say, don't go here or go here whenever. What I'm stressing here is the traditional knowledge um, of communities. And uh, on an interesting note, when I was doing the, writing up this present presentation, boga, in the same word in that sentence, boga kane, um, and Gaelic means language immersion. And that's another thing that I would suggest as well, immersing yourselves in languages and cultures and learning respectfully as well and during that process. So there's much to be learned from alternative knowledge systems and sharing insights from diverse worldviews, particularly from those indigenous and from the indigenous languages themselves, which possess an abundance of tech or traditional ecological knowledge. We can shift our perspectives, listen to and learn from alternative knowledge systems, address our arrogant elitism and embrace non-dominant heritages and languages for a better chance for lasting and sustainable change. We can encourage epistemic learning and education and just a quick, I'll touch on epistemic learning. It is framed as a higher order way of unpacking, shifting our thinking epistemically as opposed to a surface level. What, what I notice in my experience is there's a lot of surface level changes. Oh, we'll do this, we'll tick this box and this will change this and we'll tick this box, we'll, we'll do this, we'll do that. But if, unless we're doing epistemic learning or unlearning, there, there's no deeper transformative change. So there's an opportunity for English speakers who have been only raised in a human-centered worldview to learn from a decolonial, reflective and transformative experience. So some concluding remarks, languages, um, as I hope to have built during this short presentation here, a short talk, they're not commodities, they're not universal codes or neatly compacted products as a result of standardized tests or other colonial teaching practices. Languages and their speakers are inseparable from the greater ecosystem, the land, the culture and environment. And by decolonizing our minds and searching for new stories and metaphors to live by, and I'll caution that word new because it for example, indigenous stories are not new. They've been here since time immemorial. So new and existing uh, stories and metaphors to live by, we can form more sustainable and transformative relationships with people, with our communities, with our ancestral heritages, and with nature. By respecting and learning from and enacting alternative ways of knowing and being, there can be hope and change that will help sustain the future of our planet and that of future generations. And I would stress that this is for biodiversity, linguistic diversity, and cultural diversity. So, Thapalif, thank you in Gaelic, miigwech, thank you in Anishinaabemwin for listening. And um, I've got some questions. The questions are all here that I prompted during the, the talk as well, just in